Our scripture reading today comes from Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, and can be found on page 568 of your pew Bibles. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you at that time were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. By now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It's great to be here, um, and I would uh, encourage us to keep our Bibles open uh, because we'll, we'll stay with uh, the passage in front of us. Uh, but it, it's again a pleasure to be here with you, um, to get to worship with you, to sing with you, uh, and to meet you, my brothers and uh, sisters in the Lord. One of the blessings that I've enjoyed um, being in America, but also all around the world, is to discover that um, there are many people who love the Lord from different tribes, tongue, and nations. And I can see it here. Uh, yes, all of you, or many of you are Americans, but you have different origins. But we've been all been brought in this church because of Christ, and that's a great blessing. But also, one other sad thing that we observe in our communities all around the world is that we are divided. Um, and unfortunately, we keep experiencing what that means, especially when we don't get what we want. Um, and when we don't get what we want as sinful people, the attempt is to either try to silence uh, those that we are not in agreement with, or even uh, smear them. Uh, if not, if we are more powerful, we could even kill. And friends, this is not the first time it's happening. It has happened be beginning with our uh, first parents, uh, Cain, in Genesis 4. What does he do? He kills his brother. And so what are we going to do? Well, there's nothing we can do and thanks be to God, he's already done something about it. I'm grateful, too, for serving at One Voice for the past few years. It's been a blessing because I've experienced what it means to have brothers who come having different perspectives and yet united in Christ. And at the same time, there is an element of experiencing conflict that at times can be hard. And very painful. But also, I am glad that as we experience conflict, we also discover that we have all the resources we need in Christ. And that's what I'm, I'm coming with today. I would like us to look at what it means to live in God's new family today. And so the title of my message today is Life in God's New Family. I remember one professor of conflict, not from Westminster, somewhere else. Uh, we were trying to have a conversation about a topic that I'll be working on, on peacemaking. And so um, he said, how are you going to be doing this? I told him, well, I'm going to be studying what the gospel has to say um, about conflict and what we can do, or rather what God has done for us. And so I said, the gospel, I believe, is powerful. And hear, hear the words that he said. He said, 
The gospel is a tool that strengthens the powerful. The gospel is the tool that strengthens the powerful. So his point was, because he's an African, he was saying, this is what the Westerners did when they came to our country. Because they were powerful, they wanted us to be weak. And so they preached the gospel. In a a sense, he was trying to convey a message that it's actually weak, that it can't do anything. And my brothers and sisters, I would like to say that that's not true. And you will hear many people who are very qualified, who've studied, who will try to undermine your confidence and my confidence in the power of the gospel. But I want us to know that we actually have what we need. The gospel tells us who we were, but also it tells us what Christ has done, and it tells us what we have now become and what we will be. And uh, since we are looking through the book of Ephesians, we need to first be reminded what God has done. And Ephesians 1 is very rich as it gives us all the blessings that the children of God have. Uh, Paul reminds us that in Christ, we have been chosen from before the foundation of the world, and we have been made children of God. Criminal enemies of God have been made sons and daughters of God. Then in Ephesians 2, chapter verses 1 through 10, Paul tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we were by nature children of what? Children of wrath. And then I'm grateful for, but God. And then he comes in and says, but God reached in mercy because of his love. What did he do? He saved us by his grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Then he says, so that nobody can do what? Can boast. And he did that for good works. And so it's from there that we hear, therefore. One uh, theologian has called this the weighty therefore. He refers to um, therefore, especially in the... Um, epistles of Paul, he says, very often they come with heavy implications because of what the gospel has done. Verses 11 through um, 12 tell us what we once were. And that's my first point. What we once were. What does it say? It says, therefore... Remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the situation that we were in. This is the situation that Paul is telling the Ephesians and anybody who is outside Christ. I say that one commentator summarizes this as being Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. And it kind of goes in line with what Pastor John referred to last week. That the gospel is not for those who have hope or those who do not need any help, but it's for the desperate. This is the situation that the Gentiles were in. They could not go to the temple, even though it's in the temple that you would meet God and therefore worship. This is what it means to be in a relational darkness. This is what it means to be separated from someone you know loves you, but you also need at the same time. It's a hopeless situation. Now, if you remember in the Bible, the Jews by birth at their eighth day of existence, they would be circumcised. Each boy who was eight day old would undergo circumcision. And that meant that he belonged to what this passage called, calls the commonwealth of Israel. 
And so by implication, anybody who was outside that commonwealth, anybody who was not circumcised was separated, not just from Israel, but also from God's people. And the problem is not the circumcision itself, but it's the meaning of circumcision. The meaning of circumcision meant that these children were covenant children who belonged to the Lord. And the problem is, again, the Israelite missed the point. Instead of focusing on the meaning of this as inclusion in God's family, they just focused on the external. And so whoever was not circumcised, they labeled him as what? Uncircumcision. So you can imagine a Gentile walking and then a Jew and his family saying, look, uncircumcision. It was a derogatory term. And, and this is what happens, unfortunately, when it comes to um, our families, to our clans, to our camps. We label each other according to what we stand for. Versus what God says we are. And I would like us to realize that the world is not divided between the Africans, the white, the Asians, and you can continue the list. It's divided between those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. The circumcised here ought to have meant that they belong to God. And that the uncircumcised meant that they were not people who belonged to the Lord. And one thing I'm reminded of when Solomon is dedicating the temple, during his prayer of dedication, he says, Lord, let everybody who is going to come here have his prayers heard. And let them have their sins forgiven. And then he adds, even the foreigners, when they come here, may they know that there is a God who is above all gods and who is ruler of all the earth. And this is what the Jews are missing. I just mentioned that there is a relational darkness that's going on for the Gentiles. They are outside and Paul is reminding them because, you know, it's easy once you've experienced what it means to be privileged to forget what it meant to be unprivileged. And Paul wants to, real, to, to, to um, help the Ephesians realize that unless you remember what it meant to be unprivileged, you lose sight of the privilege that you have. Maybe you may remember what it meant to be outside Christ. You may remember your friends who are still there and the danger that they, are, they undergo every day. And Paul wants us to remember that. But especially, he wants us to realize that Christ drank that whole cup of eternal separation from the Lord. He wants us to realize that when Jesus faced that relational darkness on the cross, crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That meant that now there's access. You remember how the curtain between the holy and the most holy place was torn into that now there is no longer separation between uh, God's people and those um, who are coming in and who are new, who need the Lord. And that's what I would like us to look um, to uh, in the second point. What Jesus Christ has done. We're looking at what we once were. We were Christless, hopeless, friendless, stateless, and everything that follows that's dark. But what Christ has done is that he has brought us near by reconciling us to God and to his people. Verse 13 says, but now in Christ, 
you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 13, I said, I'm grateful for the but in scripture. Because whenever you hear them, before them, there's usually a desperate situation. It's either someone who is at the point of death. It's either somebody who is undergoing the worst of situations. But whenever we hear, but now, but God, but Christ, you know something good is coming. And that's what we see here. This but now points us to the fact that while this was the case in the past, now Christ has changed that situation. Verse 13 shows that Jesus was not scared by the great relational distance that existed between us and God because he had what it takes to remove it. And friends, how did he do it? He did it by his blood. He did it by his blood. Now, many people will say, is God interested in the blood of people? Why would he have somebody shed his blood? Well, if you may remember, if you shed as much blood uh, to the point that you need to receive more blood, and you don't receive it on time, what happens? You die. And Leviticus actually reminds us that life is in what? Life is in the blood. And Hebrews 9 verse 22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so every blood that was ever shed in the Old Testament was a pointer to this Jesus who would shed his blood for us. Death is the penalty for sin against a holy God. Only the blood of someone perfect in holiness and purity can be accepted before God the Father. And only Jesus is that someone given his credentials as God and man. Because of that, Jesus took our sin and overcame death on our behalf. Through the shedding of Christ's blood, we have forgiveness of sin and have been brought near to God. That's, that's what we are being reminded today, that if we were even to shed our own blood, that would not suffice. Because we are not perfect. We cannot stand before God. And because we needed a human being to represent us, because only man had sinned, Jesus is that man. And because only God can overcome death, Jesus was that God. So in him, humanity and div divinity united so that we may be saved. And that's why we can read in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 that for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A question for us today. Have you felt sometimes distant from God? Have you felt a sense of despair that even when you are praying, it doesn't seem like your prayers are going through? Friends, before Christ came, Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah who will come to be and preach peace to not only those who are near God, but also to those who are far off. I do not know which of you is coming here for the first time. But I am also coming here for the first time. And I'm happy I'm here. I want to say that nobody is too far 
that Christ cannot find you where you are. I'd like to encourage you to realize that God in Christ extends the gospel welcome to you. That however far you might feel, however you might be uh, experiencing some existential crisis in you because of feeling distance from the Lord, Christ comes to be your peace. He comes to bring you near to God. It costed him his life, and that's sufficient. All you need is that you acknowledge your need of him, that you are here to experience the help that he alone can give. Verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. In his book, The Peacemaking Pastor, Dr. Poria says, Peace is a person before it is an activity. Peace is a person before it is a sermon. And then he adds, it is because Christ is, in, is the embodiment of God's peace that Christ can make peace as well as proclaim peace. Friends, Jesus did what no other man could do. What Jesus did, he put his life on the line, as it were. It's like everybody is at risk of being shot, and then Jesus takes the bullet for those who are at high risk so that everybody else is protected in him. And friends, biblical peace that we are reading here is not just the sense of quiet and calm. Oh no, I have no conflict these days. I'm at peace. No, no, that's, that's I mean, it's part of it, but it's not the whole of it. Biblical peace is more than just a feeling of everybody's okay with me. Biblical peace is total well-being, prosperity, and security associated with God's presence among his people. No wonder Old Testament scripture says that there is no peace for who? For the wicked. It's until we are brought in the presence of Christ that we can experience this peace, this sense of belonging, this sense of wholeness, this sense of knowing I'm restored, this sense of knowing that I am at peace with the being that controls the entire universe, with the person who I can't hide from. Then Paul continues and tells us how this actually happens. He says, Christ did it by abolishing what? The wall of hostility. Now, if you would indulge me just a little bit, I'm going to read a long quote that describes this wall of hostility. This is how one commentator puts it. He says, the wall of hostility was a notable feature of the magnificent temple built in Jerusalem by Herod the Great. The temple building itself was constructed on an elevated platform around it. I want you to count the number of courts that they will be talking about. Around it was the court of the priests first. East of this was the court of Israel. Further east, the court of the women. And then he adds, these three for the priests, the men and the women of Israel, were on the same elevation as the temple. And then he adds, for from this level one descended five steps to a walled platform. Then on the other side of the wall, 14 more steps to another wall, beyond which was the outer court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles could look up and view the temple, but were not allowed to approach it. 
They were cut off from it by the surrounding stone barricade with warning notice in Greek and Latin. And this was a way of telling them, do not miss it. And then hear how the words read. They read, trespassers will not be prosecuted. Rather, trespassers will be executed. So it meant that if you were not one of the Israelites, this dividing wall meant that you couldn't get in. In fact, you were very far away physically, even as you were far away spiritually. Now, the temple was the place, again, where you could come actually and experience the blessings of belonging to the Lord. That meant you would have been distant from him. And you and I, None of us, I do not know who you are, but at least I know I'm a Gentile. Um, maybe some of you know it as well. And if salvation was by race, none of you who are Gentiles would be here today. But thanks be to God, salvation is not by race, but it's by grace. You and I, who are not Israelites, can also be called children of God because Christ has removed this wall of hostility. In Christ, Jews and Gentiles have become members of one new man, one new humanity. Now, when Paul is writing this, this, this wall of hostility was still standing. But thankfully, Christ had already died and it had already been removed spiritually. He adds that he did this by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. That's verse 15. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the, of the two, so making peace. I think the first thing that we need to notice is that the first relational distance that we had was that we were separated from God. And that's vertical relationship that's restored. And then at the same time, the vertical influences the horizontal. So that we are no longer Jew and Gentile, Asian and African White and black, yellow, green, blue, and so on. Now we are one new humanity called to live a new life in God's new family because of Christ. Now when we hear by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, the first question I wonder some of you might be asking, does that mean that now that we are in God's new family, there is no law for us? Well, there are a number of things that Paul is actually referring to. It could be that he's talking about the law of commandments that refer to the ceremonial laws. Uh, the washings that people had to do as they were getting in the temple uh, that granted them some sort of external acceptance inside and in this case they have been abolished in the sense that Christ has fulfilled that too because he's lived the perfection that we could not live he's the cleanest if you may say Jesus fulfilled all these ceremonial laws by becoming both the offering and the offer that we needed. So when we hear abolishing the law of commandments, in that sense, yes, they are abolished. We do not need to wash our feet as we get in this church. All we need is faith in Christ Jesus. The other thing could be the sense that God has abolished that sense of I need to obey so I can belong. That's what some Jew thought. They were like, oh, if I obey, I fast twice each week, then I am more accepted 
than the Jews. And you hear that with the Pharisees and uh, the tax collectors. One comes in and is like, thank God I am not like that tax collector. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. In this case, Paul is saying, that has been abolished. You do not need to obey to belong. The reverse is actually true. Because you belong to God's new family, now you obey out of a sense of gratitude for what God has done in Christ. So by faith, now we are one people of God, one body of Christ, one church through the one cross of Jesus Christ. And you know how Paul refers to this in Ephesians 3? Later on, he will talk about the mystery. He says, this is a mystery. And friends, reconciliation between man and God and God and man is a mystery that we will leave to try to experience. But also, the fact that I can come here, worship with you from Africa and you guys from different places is also a mystery. And Paul calls this a mystery of equality. Those who are regarded as very little have also become fellow heirs with the saints. Those who belonged to the commonwealth of Israel, in this case Paul, who belonged there, has come to realize, oh, my one problem was sin, and my one solution is the Savior. And so is the case with the Gentiles. Their problem was they were outside God's favor. They have experienced God's grace as a result. Now, well, we had one problem and we have one solution. Therefore, we are one. That's, that's the equation. The equation is solved in this case. Now, as you continue to read in verse 18, what do we see? We see that this happens through him. Who? Christ. And then he says, for through him, Jesus Christ, we both have access in what? One spirit to the Father. The three persons of the Trinity are involved in this affair. There's nothing that Jesus is doing that the Father is not involved in, that the Holy Spirit is involved in. So in, in a sense, we would say it requires the community of the Trinity to reconcile our communities. If we are going to be reconciled to God, we need God himself to be involved. It's through Christ, by the power of the Spirit, and we are united to the Father. And because of that, we are all one in Christ. And if we are one in Christ, as verses 19 through 22 say, we are fellow citizens with all God's people. We need to remember that we can't manufacture our relationship with the Lord. We can't manufacture it by trying to do this or that. And then when it comes to our relationship, because it's centered on Christ, we can't also manufacture our unity. I think you've had that it's kind of trendy to be a multilingual church. Thank God we are not doing that at one voice. Uh, at one voice, we believe that only Christ can bring us together. And that's the foundation. And I hope and pray, and you can join us in your prayers, that we will continue to be that way. We'll continue to remember that the unity that we have as a multilingual, multi-ethnic church is around Christ. What is the point I'm trying to make here? Is that because we are brought to God by the triune God himself, if we are going to maintain this unity, 
we will still need to rely on the same triune God. It's still going to be by God the Father himself through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Verses 19 to the end say, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place by God, the Holy Spirit. So again, it's the same thing. The same miracle that brings us to God is the same that needs to keep us connected to him, but also to one another. I will end with a short story just about my own um, pilgrimage as someone who's been traveling first from my home country to Uganda and then to the United States. As a student here, guess how my visa read? It read non-immigrant alien. That's how it read. So I, I wasn't even a resident in the United States um, as a student. Some of you may have experienced what that means. And at One Voice, we have many people who are still trying to figure out their status. They're still waiting to be joined to the Commonwealth of the United States, if I may say. And this can be Difficult, because if you're looking for a job, you're still trying to learn a new language. It's very difficult. And it was difficult for me to switch from a French system to an English system. But the greatest news is that even then, even when someone may, may feel like an outsider everywhere else, in God's house, we all have the highest citizenship ever. We belong to the king of the universe. And not just as servants and friends, but as members of his family. We belong to God the Father. We are his children. It's even more than birth. Why? Because we were enemies of his criminals, and he turned us into his sons and daughters. This is the joy that I've had of belonging to a church here, back home, everywhere. And that's the blessing that you all have. And I would like us to look at that this week as you face the challenges of this divided world Remember, remember, you and I are fellow citizens. We belong to a kingdom that will never fall. My country has been divided by many conflicts, and it's unstable, always. And now I pray that that doesn't happen to any of our nations, that we'll pray that we'll be peaceful, and that we may vacate to our usual vacation and do every work that we need to do. But even if it happens, may we never forget that in Christ we have an eternal citizenship that nobody can ever take from us. We have a father who is not just a king who is distant, but who is with us and who joins us to brothers and sisters here and everywhere, but also eternally, that's what we have. As I began saying, if we are going to appreciate this, if we are going to appreciate what it means to live in God's new family, we will need to remember what, what we once were. That we were separated from Christ 
alienated from the commonwealth of God's people. And then we also need to remember what Christ has done for us. That through his blood, he has brought us near God. And there, he has become our peace. We have peace with God and with one another. And now, who are we? We are members of God's new family as sons and daughters. I pray that this will continue to be true of you. This will continue to be true of me. That even when we face conflict, because it's going to come, that we would be remembered we will be remembering that we have security in Christ. That it's going to stand forever. It won't change. This is a privilege, but also it's a responsibility to go out and be peacemakers. First, by our way of life, but also by proclaiming this good news to those who need it. Colossians 3 reminds us to, to, um, to have this peace dwell in us because what we have been called to is what? We've been called to peace. So that's what we will do this week. We'll do this even in the chaotic seasons of our lives, our countries, and different things that are going on around us. May we go out Boldly and yet humbly. Boldly because we have the king of, of the universe on our side. But also humbly because this message doesn't belong to us. But also may we continue to say, Lord, we need you. Because we can't do it on our own. Let us pray.